to the room. In our last lecture, we considered the characteristic property of wave function free space. And we observed that the energy of wave function free space is continuous since the boundary conditions exist in free space. In this lecture, we will consider the effect of boundary conditions on the state or better still the wave function, so that the discontinuity affecting the boundary condition will therefore be regarded as the quantum well. As will be seen in the part, part two of this lecture anyway, we will show that the energy of the wave function in any confinement or a well is quantized and not continuous like the space. So, to begin, it would be worthy of note to establish at this point that the quantum well is used to optimize the efficiency or better still, the spectrum of lasers, LEDs, and even optical regulators. And the spectra of these devices are usually optimized by determining the wavelength that it will emit at. So the quantum well is seen as a thin-layered semiconductor in which many quantum mechanical effects can be observed and controlled. Usually, it is derived by sandwiching certain semiconductor device, say, semiconductor device type. One here, for instance, other semiconductor device. One here, for instance, special level similarities. And here, let's say, we have semiconductor type two. And this distance, so D, is usually seen to be quite small. Hence, we can therefore define quantum wells a nanometer thin layer seven point one points confirm In this case, the electron, okay? In this case, as a particle, the electron. Dimensions perpendicular to the surface there, whereas the movement of the other dimensions is on street. So the confinement is a quantum effect. Because the particles now have to drift into this region and in this region. 
and this quantum effect is confinement have effect on the density of states. Now, quantum well can therefore be realized by embedding a thin layer of a semiconductor medium between other semiconductor layers. So let's assume something. Standard. This layer with gallium. Let me see aluminum gallium. See so, so, so layer gallium. So, The basic idea about quantum well is to determine how many charged carriers we trapped in the well, which is very useful for semiconductor devices. And the process of fabrication through molecular DNA taxi. Or true metal organic chemical for decomposition. Okay. So, so uh, should the quantum wave be subject to strain as, uh, as can be caused by slides? Lattice mismatch, then the electronic states are further modified, which can be very useful in laser values. So, in quantum world, the results from the sandwich between different layers of uh, different energy band gap results in the region surrounding a local minimum, so local minimum of the potential well called the energy. Okay. So here we know that the discontinuities in the conduction band, say this is the conduction band sub so C, is a result of the difference in the material, okay? So for that to these discontinuities, the boundary conditions may be defined at the boundaries informing the material difference. So now we have this boundary, also have this boundary, okay? So if for instance, this is of D, then at zero to D, we can establish some boundary condition. Oh, no. We should note that if we investigate the quantum well in one dimension, so that the particles are confined in one dimension, as we have back here, and we say this quantum well. Yeah, quantum well. Wire quantum wires confines to dimension, then quantum dots confines 
every dimension. So let us consider one dimension of problem. Now, if a beam of particles moving with a constant initial velocity, particle moves initial constant velocity, B naught, or kinetic energy, T naught being the same as R, B naught squared, which is the same as the term squared the mass in region one, so it means that. Well, so it is a sort of job. Okay. This is a sort of job. So, John. John. so, okay, here we jump three. So this particle is moving with the minimum P naught, okay? Such that the energy is squared by the two. If this particle, this beam of particle, is incident on a simple boundary, say at this point, x equals zero, Separating two constant potential energy regions, separating this region, this region. Then, we will observe that the probability distribution function must be single valued everywhere in space. That is, the state must be continuous across the bound, such that state function, which are one, must be the same, must be continuous, such that side one, side one, same. Therefore, the integral of the density function has to be the same as one. Well. Now, if that is that, then it means that at the boundary, x equals zero t is be the same as the state function boundary two plus zero. For this boundary condition to satisfy the wave function on both sides of the boundary, then this time dependence must follow directly. So the wave function is continuous across the boundary. And then the solution will be the same as psi s of t that we already saw in our the boundary j t with the same as the wave function with second bound. So, so, 
Yes. Okay. And x equal to zero with the same energy E, which means the total energy must be constant conserved. So E therefore will be constant across the boundary. Hence the energy is a constant. Also note that the wave function in the first boundary must be an angular function of the Hamiltonian corresponding to the angular value e being the same as p squared. So m with the, with the dependence or time dependence on epsilon j. Cross C. Now, the continuity of the wave functions across the boundary is an important is an important basic condition on all wave functions in quantum mechanics, and therefore, we also want to consider the boundary condition on the spatial derivative of the wave function. That is, d dx. And since the wave function must satisfy the time independence Rodinger equation, it can be integrated over an infinitesimal range delta across the range of negative delta over 2 to positive delta over 2, considering the well being that this is of nanometer dimension it's nanometer so if this is delta this is negative delta of two taking this origin at zero then this is positive delta of two then we could integrate the wave function over the interval negative delta over two plus delta of two such that we have H cross squared to n theta squared over the x squared plus v of x so e of x the x will be the same as the energy integral to delta two delta of two so e x x here yeah. since the energy is a constant of motion then e is the same as negative h cross squared over to m d squared dx squared such that we now have the solution is negative h cross squared over 2 divided by 1 over m e dx south e of x taking on values from negative the data for 2 so data of 2 this will give us e minus 1 over 2v Of e of x, size of e of x, or the zero delta, for which v can take on values, positive values or negative values. So recall that for any arbitrary wave function, uh, we can expand such a function as a superposition of the angular functions of the Hamiltonian such that the wave function, time-dependent Schrodinger equation, 
can play for the defenders. Simulation, sigma, CA, RPM, X, so K, N, cross T. And the corresponding derivatives of any linear combination of the angle function must satisfy the same conditions such that one over the mass in region one d dx psi the wave function in the first region for x equal to zero that boundary condition is the same as one over the mass of the particle, the second region, d dx, is a wave function in the second region, and x equals zero. Now, when the effective mass m of the particle does not change across the boundary, then the derivative of the wave function must be continuous across the boundary, such that this, since m1 is the same as m2, so this component will cross out, right? Then we can now Present the boundary condition C D X for S T for X equal to zero will be the same as T D X It should be noted that. When the effective mass of the particle changes across the boundary, that is m sub one is not the same as m sub two, the mass of the particle in region one is not the same as the mass of the particle in region two, then we have an heterojunction, heterojunction between the two different semiconductors. It will therefore be the spatial derivative of the wave function divided by the effective mass that must be continuous across the boundaries. Since the particles cannot be stored or accumulated in an infinitely thin boundary, therefore the probability current or current density, J, the number of particles through the boundary per unit area per time per unit time must be continuous such that the gradient of the current density or the current probability is the same as negative d t rho which is the same as negative d dt times the probability density function. This, one. And this is the same as negative DDT. The conjugate ST psi ST. You should know that the negative sign may be attributed to Lenz law which says that the direction of the induced current will oppose the change in the flux that creates it or that created it. So in one dimension, we now have the probability current, J of X in the X direction, dx be the same as negative ST, D, D, T, sine of ST, minus. So for ST, D, D, T, 
And by applying the time dependent Schrodinger's uh, equation to the right hand side of this expression, we therefore have negative j h cross two n conjugate s t d squared x squared self s t plus j h cross over two n self s t squared d x squared plus s t which will be the same as d dx minus j h cross to n plus s t dx side s t j h cross so then, side S T D D X S T. Now the S component of the probability current therefore becomes so S to negative J H cross to N. S T D S so S T S J cross over J N so S T D D X S T now in three dimensional case. 3D, the current density of the probability current be given as J H cross of 2N T the gradient function. J cross over two n note that if the wave function psi is such that the conjugate of t is the gradient of the wave function is purely real, purely real, meaning no imaginary part, then the current J must be equal to zero. This implies that for the current in any given region not to be equal to zero, the corresponding De Broglie wave in that region must be a propagating wave. So for an exponentially damped wave or standing waves, the corresponding particle must be zero. That is the corresponding current must be zero as expected because it's a standing wave. Now, if we present the region, say this for which we have E, then in this potential, well, we have V, okay? So that V is equal to zero. Now, a beam of particle incident on the potential energy step at x equal to zero, the potential energy step may either be 
a step down as we have here, or it could also be a step up, okay? So that is, is V, and then we have the energy, then V is equal to zero, okay? So hence, V may either be positive or negative. And in the classical perspective, when the change in the potential is negative, the particle will have 100% probability of moving from region one to region two, okay? Because it does not require much energy to come down the heat. By gaining in kinetic energy, of the amount say V naught and velocity V naught plus uh, two uh, square root of V naught squared plus two V naught over M. Also, if the change in the potential is positive, that is T naught, which is the kinetic energy, which is half mv naught squared, is less than V naught, then there will be 100% probability that no particle will get to region two from down this hill to this, except sufficient energy is given. So in other words, E must be sufficiently large, larger than V, okay? But in quantum mechanics, to know the state of the particles, it will be necessary to compute the wave function of the particles from region one to region two. And here you will observe or note that the energy is conserved. That is the total energy is a constant of motion and the same in both regions. If that is so, the wave function must be an angle function of the Hamiltonian, of the particle corresponding to the energy, which is half mv naught squared, so that the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian operator operating on the state function will be the same as the energy times the wave function. Hence, in Schrodinger equation, we have that H hat is the same as always, H cross over two M, the squared, the X squared, plus V of X, so V of X is the same as E so V of X. And we can rewrite this by expanding this process such that E plus E of T is the same as H cross squared over two and it is squared dx squared psi of e, e of x, e of x, psi of e of x. So I'll open up the brackets. And if we are rearrange this as e, psi of e of x, psi of minus v of x, psi of e of x, it's got a negative h cross to n d squared five p of x over the x squared. Then we have that two n into bracket e say e since they are common that will be e minus v of x. 
self e friends divided by cos squared equals to negative squared self e of x divided by the x squared such that the squared self of x and the x squared is the same as negative to m e minus v of x over h cos squared self e of x. And if k if we assume if we take k k squared to be the same as 2m e minus v of x over h cross squared, then the Schrodinger equation will become at least 2k is equal to this expression, then the Schrodinger equation becomes the squared south e of x dx squared equal to minus k squared south e of x which is a second order differential equation and the solution can be placed appropriately and from this expression we see that k is the same as the square root of 2m e minus v of x over h cross squared which is the same as the square root of 2m e minus v of x over each cross. Okay, good. Now, we observe that in region one, v of, f, v of x is zero because say, you have something like this. So particle is moving in this direction. This is the potential v of x. And this is region one, this is region two, okay? And now at this point, we have E, and in this region, V of X is zero. Hence, K1, K1 be the same square root of two, m e when v naught is zero divided by h cross and in region two v of x say is given as v then the wave number k2 in region two in this region will be the same as square root of 2m e minus v divided by h cross. Now, if e is less than v, for instance, then we can estimate the imaginary part of k as alpha, in case of auto j alpha, such that alpha now be the same as square root of 2m v minus e over h cross. Okay. So this way, we can now figure out the solution to the problem. And in this case, we have the well region looking like this. And as such, we now estimate the wave function in region one and the wave function in region two, okay? And if, for instance, uh, 
the wave travels in this direction, it's incident, that's an incident wave. And here we have the transmitted wave. Then we are expected to get a reflected wave such that the wave function in region one will be the sum of the incident wave plus the reflected wave. While in region two, the wave function will be the transmitted wave. Because at this boundary, for the wave crossing this boundary, this is a condition we've got at x equal to zero. So if that's what we have, then we can therefore establish that the wave function in region one based on the solution to the Schrodinger equation will be the same as say a exponential j k1 of x plus the reflected wave. So since it's a reflected wave, we now have a negative value, K1, X because it's in the region one. Because we already established K1, wave number four in the region one, and here K2 as a wave number in region two, as a propagation constant. And then based on this analysis, the wave function in, region two, we therefore become x will be the same, say c exponential j k2 x without any reflected component, okay? I guess into, except it hits another boundary. So here, this is for x less than zero, and this is for x greater than zero, because these are values of x less than zero, and here is are values of x greater than zero. And at the boundary, this is x equal to zero. Good. Now, based on this, we can therefore evoke the boundary conditions. And by the boundary conditions, we said that the wave function is continuous. So meaning the wave function in region one is the same as the wave function in region two. And also the derivative of the wave function in region one is the same as the derivative of the wave function in region two. So if that is what it is, then based on boundary condition one, boundary condition one, boundary condition two, now based on boundary condition one, then A exponential J, K, S plus B exponential minus J, K, one, X is equal to C exponential J, K, two, X. And also based on Boundary condition two, we have the derivative. So if we take the derivative of this, that will be k one a exponential j k one x minus that's minus k one b exponential minus j k one x would be the same as k2 c exponential j k2 x. So now we have a system of equations based on the boundary conditions as um, 
Okay. Exponential. J K one X plus B exponential minus J K one X equal to C exponential J K two X and also K one A exponential J K one X minus K one B exponential minus J K one X the same as k2 c exponential j k2 x now since equality holds we can also assume or better still establish that the constants will be equal such that a plus b in this case is the same as c and k1a minus k1b is equal to k2 c so that a minus b k1 is equal to k2 c so we could solve these two system of equations now if we bring a plus b equal to c and k1 a minus b equal to c. You will see here that a is the incident wave, as we already mentioned. Incident wave. B is the reflected wave. And c is the transmitted wave. So if this is one, this is two. So if we put one into two, we are going to get K1 into bracket A minus B is equal to K2 to bracket A plus B. And this will give us K1A minus K1B k to a plus k to b for rearrange that's k1 a minus k2 a what k1 b plus k2 b so we have a into bracket k1 minus k2 which is equal to b k1 plus k2 such that B, which is a reflected wave over the incident wave, be the same as K1 minus K2 over K1 plus K2. And recall that K1 is the same as the square root of 2ME over H cross, and K2 is the same as square root of 2m e minus v over h cross. So once we substitute these parameters into this, then we are going to get square root of e minus square root of e minus v divided by square root of e plus square root of e minus v. And now, we can therefore also show in a similar vein that B is equal to C minus A from one, right? That's from one. So that K1, A minus K1B is equal to K2C. Then we now have K1A minus K1C minus A is equal to K2C. 
K1A minus K1C plus K1A is equal to K2C. So we now have two K1A is the same as K1C plus K2C. So that two K1A is the same as K1 plus K2 to have C. Now, if we take the transmitted wave over the incident wave, we now have 2K1 over K1 plus K2. And once we substitute the values of K1 and K2, once again, we have 2 root E, root E minus square root of E. So you will observe that B over A and C over A are the ratios of the complex amplitude of the reflected, reflected, and the transmitted wave to the incident waves. Therefore, the transmission coefficient T will now be given as the current probability of the transmitted wave divided by the current probability of the incident wave, which is going to give us K2 over K1, C over A squared, which is the same. 4 k1 k2 over k1 plus k2 squared all mod and once we substitute those values we will get the mod 4 square root e into bracket e minus v divided by square root of e plus square root of E minus V squared. Now, when E is greater than V, or better still, K2 is purely real. And if E is less than V, or K2 is purely imaginary, then the transmission coefficient will be equal to zero. So whether V is less than or greater than E or K2 is purely real or imaginary, the reflection coefficient will always exist. So the reflection coefficient R will be the same as the current probability of the reflected wave divided by the current probability of the incident wave, which will be the same as B over A mod squared, which is the current density, that will be K1 minus K2 over K1 plus K2. And once we substitute the values of the uh, various wave numbers, so we have E minus square root of E plus V divided by square root of E, square root of E minus V plus square root. Now recall, Kirchhoff's current law, that total current into and out of the boundary is always conserved. That is, the reflected, uh, but I say the reflection coefficient plus the transmission coefficient must not be greater than one.
must should be equal to one. This is regardless of whether E is greater or less than B. Hence, R, the reflection coefficient, can never be zero. Since T, since the transmission coefficient can be zero, okay? That is no particle can never have 100% probability of going through the sharp boundary that is at T equal to one, separating two regions. So, based on all of this, reflection can only occur when the boundary is sharp relative to the de Broglie wavelength, H of the square root of 2me of the incident de Broglie wave. So when E is less than V, the corresponding wave function is a damped wave in region two, okay? That is psi E in region two, X, is the same as C as we mentioned, minus alpha to x for x greater than zero, where alpha two is the same as two m v minus e divided by h cross, and then. The implication is that once the wave crosses this boundary, rather than being transmitted, it is seen to return back to region one. This is region one, this is region two. Okay, likely because it's a damped wave. So once the wave is incident on this boundary, once again, it is expected to be transmitted, but soon it is seen to head back to region one. And so that goes on and on. On and on, such so that we experience such a curve in the x direction. It's x equal to zero, likely because E is less than V, okay? Now, the implication of this wave function is that the number of particles in region two decreases exponentially with distance from the boundary X equal to zero, which is a quantum mechanic effect. Now, that is in region two, there are as many particles going in the positive x as the negative x direction or every particle that penetrates into region two turns around and heads back to region one so hence there can be no net current flow in region two so that t naught is equal to zero and then r is equal to one because all the particles are seen to be reflected back to region one Know that there are still particles in region two, since the probability distribution function of particles in the region is not equal to zero. So if there's another interface now separating between region two, like we've been considering, now let's assume there's another boundary here, separating region two, from another region three, such that V of region two of, yeah, of region three and region one are equal, such that V two is greater than E is greater than this. Now, if we have something like this, we can therefore reposition this. So let's assume we have this 
something like this, such that. Okay. Now, a beam of particle at a constant velocity incident on the potential barrier in the region will be between zero to D, right? Okay, this is region one, this is region two, and this is region three. Now, since the wave function must be continuous at all the boundaries, that is, psi of one, and one must be the same as this, must be the same as this. Some particles reaching the second boundary between region two and three will have a finite probability of passing through boundary and reaching region three. That is, particles normally head back, right? Head back. But since there are still some particles here, the net charge is not zero, then some particles may be seen to also penetrate to region three. So this effect is usually referred to as the quantum mechanical tunneling effect. So if we consider a single boundary separating two potential regions of semi-infinite extent, a finite potential structure can be defined as consisting of two boundaries separating three potential regions, given by, say, V of X would be the same as V of one, let's say, potential in boundary one, then the potential in boundary two, then the potential in boundary three, right? Now, this would be the same as the potential in boundary one, there's a difference in potential when V1 is the same as V3. For zero less than X less than T. And this would be true for this equal to V3. For zero less than X. And X greater than D. And this will be so too for this equal to V1 for X greater than T and X and zero less than X. So as shown previously, the general solution of the corresponding time independent Schrodinger equation for the three regions will now follow directly. So uh, let us square this. So this is what we now have. So in region one, we have in region two, then we have in region three. So this is Now since the particle moves from, this is region one to Three. So since the particle moves from region one to region two, so this would be incident wave. So we have a transmitted component here, and then we have a reflected component here. Uh, uh, okay. So in the first instance here, in this region, we have two components in region one, the incident and the reflected wave, which would be a function of K1. So here we have K2, the propagation constant, here we have K3. So hence here we can specify the solution as the incident wave, K1x in positive direction, plus 
B, the reflected wave. So K1, propagation constant, moves in the opposite direction. So we have epsilon minus J K1 X. This is for X less than zero. Now, in this case, this wave transmitted gets to this boundary. It now becomes the incident wave. Then we have a transmitted component. And once again, we have a reflected component. So it means in this boundary, we have two waves. So let's say it's the same as C exponential J K2X plus D exponential the reflected component minus J K two X, right? That's in the second boundary. Two okay. X. Now this is for the regions between zero less than X less than D. This is zero. This is D. So at this boundary, so here, this is X. Right, there's x direction. So at this axis here, here, yeah, s is less than zero. So by here, we have zero less than x less than d. So at this point, x is greater than d. So you see that there's no other boundary here. So we have just a transmitted component. Now we can use e because that's for energy. So let's say f, f so long. J, the propagation constant here is three, K three X for X greater than D. And also we'll see that K one is the same, square root of two M E minus V one over H cross, not H cross, not H cross squared, because the square root is taking care of that. H cross. Now K2 will be the same, square root of 2m, e minus v2 divided by H cross. And K3 will be the same as square root of 2m, e minus v3 divided by H cross. Now, in the case where E is greater than v1, for which V1 is the same as V3, then K1 and K3 are always real, while K2 may be real or imaginary, okay? Such that the imaginary part K2 will be equal to J alpha 2. And then, just like we showed earlier, alpha 2 will now be square root of 2m, B2 minus E, divided by H plus. Okay? And then, what we will now have will be sine of E of 2 will be equal to C exponential minus alpha two X plus D exponential alpha two X for X less than zero, less than D, okay? Now by applying the boundary conditions in this case, we have that F, which is the transmitted uh, wave divided by the incident wave, will give us epsilon minus J K3 D over cos K2 D minus J K1 squared plus K2 squared divided by 2k1 k2 
sine K2D. And the corresponding transmission coefficient T will be given as one plus delta V squared sine squared K2D divided by four E minus V1 E minus V2 minus this is for E less than V2 less than E. Now when E is less than V2, it is more convenient to replace the sine function by the corresponding sine function, uh, which is given as T in the same as one plus theta V squared sine squared alpha 2D divided by T for E minus V. V2 minus E out of the universal form. Hence, all the factors of T are positive. So in quantum mechanics, the transmission from region one through region two into region three is finite. This implies that even when the kinetic energy of the particles in region two is negative, the particles still have a finite probability of tunneling through the barrier region two and emerging in barrier region three. So this quantum mechanical tunneling effect is applied in tunnel diodes. I think this is a good place to stop. So we'll pick things up from here in our next lecture. Bye for now.